to our new themed topic of uh, future of electric vehicles. Obviously, um, you know, we've been doing these sessions uh, remotely for the past few years, so it's kind of gratifying to see faces and, and whatnot. So thank you for uh, attending this seminar. And I hope uh, that you uh, learn something interesting uh, and it contributes to the uh, field. So um, with that, we'll just dive into the agenda. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, my personal bio experience, uh, where I work, some patents that, that I've uh, acquired uh, along with the, the, the you know, teammates at, at, at my job. And then we're gonna dive into like the history of power conversion, power electronics theory, what switch mode means uh, in the classic era. And then we'll extend that a little bit to topologies, magnetics and control. And then time permitting, we'll, we'll jump into uh, tube audio amplifier design. Um, that's kind of like a work in, in progress for me. I try to incrementally update things as, uh, as the years go by. And uh, with the idea of actually using switch mode power supplies in vacuum tubes amplifiers because uh, I feel like you know they still make the same designs from the 1950s or 40s or whatever, but um, it seems like the audio enthusiasts haven't really caught on to changing or updating those type of designs. And I think with the advent of technology moving as fast as it is, it uh, it's it can only help that that become much better in terms of weight and articulated power. And then uh, for those who are interested in pursuing uh, more um, theory or learning more about that, I, I'm just gonna share some of the books that I've read and that I consistently uh, review uh, because this is a really evolving field. I think electrical engineering is, is right now at a, a very important pivotal point in time, uh, especially with the advances in gallium nitride and silicon carbide. No, I. They are considered a power converter, but they are saturable converters, and they actually make switch mode power supplies with mag amps. They originally became popular in the the rockets that the Germans. Was the EMI? Uh, no, they were just EMP resistant. So, so they were used during World War II, and then. They faded out, but those were um, very reliable. Is EMP real? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, yeah. It can't cause destruction. Yeah. The problem is, is you know, I'm not understanding how powers are going to square one. Right. right. So, anyways, a bit, a little bit about myself. I feel like uh, power electronics is one of those fields that, at least when I was attending college, it wasn't like a formalized field. Most people that got into it was basically by accident, and that's how I ended up getting into it. But a little earlier than that, uh, in Cuba, my dad was a radar engineer and he always instilled like an inventive spirit. There was always something going on because in Cuba being an isolated island and with the embargo and everything, you couldn't get a lot of things. So, um, you know, you had to kind of reinvent existing machines, electric machines and stuff to do multiple functions. Uh, and that was due to the uh, lack of access to technology uh, to the island, which really exists now. So I feel uh, quite, um, how you say, lucky to be exposed to that. And uh, although I didn't have any uh, conventional toys like most kids, you know, my, my dad's toolbox and basically what you're seeing there uh, as demo, um, I, that's what I grew up around, seeing stuff take apart, fiddling with it, figuring out how it works. And it's been, uh, very gratifying, and I was able to pursue that professionally. And uh, I continue to stay heavily involved with the IEEE, obviously with TCNJ, and um, you know, uh, just continue to get involved in in the field because it's one of the, uh, you know it's one of these fields that is continually changing and evolving. Um, with that, some of my professional experience, I started working in. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think I'm good. Yeah, is, is everything running okay? Because I. I have it running, but I don't know if it's actually running. Uh, you are sharing, right? Okay, yeah. So it looks like it's good. They can see that. Okay. And you're unmuted, correct? Unmuted, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. You're good. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, so I started working at a TV shop at a really early age. I think I was like 11 years old. I had to get. What city or what state? Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, New Jersey, actually. Apex Television was the name of the outfit. And um, I started obviously taking things apart, and that kind of evolved into, you know, pursuing this as a career. My first job was working at Avionic Instruments, designing switch mode power supplies that were used to energize the uh, clusters inside, you know, military and commercial aircraft. Much later, when I was working towards my graduate degree, I was working at Anna Digits. Um, they're no longer around. They were bought out by 3.8, another outfit in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, that makes uh, lasers. Um, but anyways, my function there was designing and using my uh, device physics background to design um, amplifiers, RF amplifiers that went into cell phones. And uh, the interesting thing about that job was that we were able to like chemically form the wafers to how we want them to perform. And one of the things that I was involved with heavily was with the device guys um, being able to what I call like band gap engineering. We wanted a transistor or an amplifier to operate this way. We would talk to the process folks in the in the uh, back end and be like, hey, can we change this formulation? So but then what you see on the far right is just a wafer map. And I developed a piece of software that was able to scan and test all the amplifiers that were on that single wafer, which at times were like 10,000 amplifiers. And some of that data was given to product engineers and they would be able to um, you know, reflect which, which particular amplifiers were pristine and which ones were not and which one were mediocre. And they sold those to different markets and stuff. Much later, I continued working in, in, uh, in switch mode power supplies at, at a company that's still around actually. They're, in the sh uh, down the shore, Jersey Shore Dialite. Um, when I came on board, all their indicators and pedestrian stop and decrement timer lights and traffic lights uh, were all incandescent. It was during a time where LEDs was just beginning to be introduced in the market. So they needed switch mode power supplies to energize the different arrays of LEDs. So I worked a lot with my physics background to uh, do a lot of photometric uh, measurements to make sure that the switch mode power supply uh, was reliable and was efficient in terms of getting the correct amount of luminosity and shading. And, and that thing on the far right is what they call a shark fin diagram, which is used to color mix various LEDs to get you know whatever uh, color hue you'd like. And then presently I'm working at, at uh, Simcoe ION, which is a uh, subsidiary company owned by ITW. And um, what I do there is I design, um, uh, I design switch mode power supplies for them as well in the electrostatic uh, business. A lot of folks say, well, how are electrostatic power supplies used and whatnot? Um, well, a perfect example or one or two examples is like the paper bag industry. Uh, you know, when, when they manufacture these paper bags, they're sent uh, to a factory, uh, probably the diameter of this room and maybe the height and the geometry of it is such that it's like a cylindrical capacitor. So they wind and unwind this raw material. And as it's being conveyed, um, you can have contact separation. Anytime you have uh, conveyed material of dissimilar or similar uh, material, you can have um, separation of charge. And depending on the speed and the geometry shape, uh, you can have really high uh, potential gradients that can be generated. Yeah, so, so you know, those gradients uh, typically uh, do two things. They can either cause an incendiary process where a factory can explode, uh, catch the material on fire, damage the material, or cause operator, operator safety issues. Because usually the voltages you're dealing with are like in the kilovolts, 100 kilovolts, very low current. But the, uh, uh, I guess the, uh, the threshold level that we have for that type of voltage and current level will cause involuntary muscle movement. Uh, so, you know, there, there's been uh, documented uh, cases where someone is working on a piece of machinery and things are electrostatically charged and inadvertently they'll, they'll ground themselves to some chassis as they're doing maintenance and they'll have a screwdriver or something and they actually you know, stab their eye out or stab someone or, or self-inflicted, uh, 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 you know, so it, it can be quite, quite dangerous.
Um, <laughs> so, no, it's a different, that's a calibration company. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's the same name, but different uh, job function. Uh, I kind of skipped the slide here. One, one of the things that I, I do, um, I feel fortunate enough that I, you know, my career choice, I feel like it's a hobby too. You know what I mean? Because I started out at a really early age, as I mentioned with my dad and um, was able to pursue that as a career. And uh, I also have it as a continual hobby. And I've always been an audio aficionado. In fact, um, to uh, pay for college, I, I was doing a lot of heavy DJing back in the 90s in New York City and a lot of other outfits. And then, um, you know, once I got to graduate school, I didn't have all much time for that. But uh, I, I like building amplifiers, both analog and uh, digital class D. Um, but lately, I've been spending a lot of time with tube amps. And uh, I've been revisiting a lot of the things that are going on there. So and I, I repair some of these things for a friend of mine that owns a uh, music shop that, uh, you know, sometimes they'll get customers that come in and say, hey, I have a tube amp and something's going on with it. Yeah, there's a, a there's a, an array of things, but I, I kind of enjoy the hunt of looking for the failure mode mechanism. And it also um, gives me uh, heavy insight on how other designers think how they organize the circuits and why did they do that? So I, I kind of enjoy that. And that kind of is the litmus to spark some ideas um, that are reflective in some of the products that, that uh, you know, I'm able to design with my uh, team members at, at Simco Ion. Um, so, so back, <laughs> which ones? Oh, uh, electric. We have two types of ionization: AC ionization and uh, pulsed DC ionization. And I'll get a little bit into how how that that works and why. Um, but I also want to get to the electric vehicle stuff, which is a lot of fun. Uh, another example um, is me you know, medical catheters. When they when they make uh, plastic catheters, they they have a a mold, and in that mold, they pour the plastic uh, pellets and they heat up the mold and it contours itself to the mold. And as they pull it, uh, they protrude the, the, the catheter. But in the process of doing that, there's contact separation between the mold and the catheter. So in this case, I'm showing a worst case scenario where there's like debris that um, adheres to the catheter in the process of being manufactured. And that's not a good thing. So we use electrostatic equipment to be able to neutralize that charge and have uh, you know the the manufacturing process come out static free, so uh, that's a, a two examples of of uh, you know where these power supplies are. Um, again, there's two types of technology that that we that I work on. Um, you know, AC technology uh, is is actually the first technology that was involved in ionization. It uses sinusoidal. Uh, yeah, you know, sinusoidal frequency of 60 hertz and the voltages we're talking about are like 7 kV. So there's some inefficiencies in, in, in AC ionization in the sense that the, um, the amount of ionization that is utilized uh, for neutralization is only uh, done at the peak because you have to break the threshold of air being ionized as you excurt through the sine wave. So you're only making productive ionization towards the peaks of those sine waves and not in the process of getting to the peak or the trough of the opposing. So you're, it does work and it has its application usually for not so fast moving webs, 500 uh, feet per, per second um, type of applications. But for faster applications, you'll want a pulsed uh, DC system, which I'm showing in the middle there, where you know this works at like really high frequency. So, that's kind of in tune with you know why we're using switch mode power supplies to do this, and there are several reasons why we do that. Um, first of all, there's the weight issue. The ferro resonant transformer weighs like 10 pounds, and the little transformer that you see in the middle there that weighs like one hundredth of a pound. So, and then you can get similar articulated voltage, and uh, depending on the ferrite that you choose, the core volume and other magnetic properties you can you can really get a lot of different um power densities out, out of the device um, yeah. 
Oh, here we go. So anyway, some of these um, some of these power supplies uh, are standalone, like what you're seeing here for both neutralizing and charging systems. Some of them are, uh, are used standalone, and then the consumer uses specific applicators based on their um, product that they're that they're building. Um, so we get into the business of also making uh, specialized applicators to go with the power supplies. But one thing that that has been a dramatic uh, impact have been the switch mode power supplies because they're so small and lightweight. Now we can embed them into the applicators. So now the customer doesn't have to have like a separate power supply and an applicator, one working on 120 or 240 volts. Now you just have like low voltage DC and then we can use, you know, switching techniques to elevate that voltage or, or um, you know, switch the frequency, the amplitude, the phase. Uh, no, it's a specialized high voltage cable. It's kind of, yeah, like in, in the cases of like uh, standalone applicators, we have kind of like the voltage cables that you would see on like the CRT. Days, you know, to, yeah, there, there's there's different, uh, you know, uh, plastic uh, com composites that are used for that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. So then um, this is like an exploded view of one of our products that, you know, um, I've been a, a, a part of and, and the team as well. Um, you know, we have a really good software engineer and the, the director actually. Uh, comes up with some really amazing ideas on how to consolidate these things. And it's a lot, for me, it's a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy the challenge. Yeah, long and thin. Just... Well, we, we find that there are certain applications where um, the product that's being uh, manufactured or conveyed, there's just not a lot of room to stick these applicators in. So that's just been a geometry that has worked uh, quite well for us and yeah exactly so this is just a short bar but we make bars that are like 10 foot long and sometimes we get into customized uh applications where like i said before the different web application material is wider or shorter so we make uh quite a bit an array of different products that no the outputs are coming out of those resistively coupled pins that's where the high voltage is coming from at the very uh Top. You're just seeing a side profile. Okay. So those pins would be facing the web as it as it moves underneath. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's what you're doing. You're you're basically creating high voltage to break the threshold of air, and then have electrons, uh, you know, spin out of those pins to be able to equate to the voltage that you're trying to neutralize. So there's a negative difference. The material is coming off is negative or positive? Is that changing? Well, the material per se, um, what drives the polarity of the material is not the uh, not the fact that you're driving it. Speed certainly has a uh, uh, an, an additive component in terms of of the potential level, but what really the the, the secret sauce as to what makes a material more positively uh conducive and another one more negative conducive is um based on the metallurgy of the material there's this thing called a tribo series and uh depending on like uh for example like wool would be more like negative or something like that it's almost like a manufacturing kind of material. yeah 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 that that could be a good model for it actually yeah. you know you're ionizing the air, so you discharge static. It doesn't matter which way. Well, the air acts as a transport mechanism. Yeah, but the ionization is what discharges static, obviously. Yes. It makes the air conductive. Correct. The electrons come out of the air that are only changing the quality of the air, and the air is becoming low resistance. It doesn't matter which way the current goes, the product or the machine. Well, depending on the polarity, what we like to do is remove it. You wouldn't have to take that into consideration. Again, the material, yeah, you yeah, yeah, you do because you you can't if if you if you energize those pins on a single polarity, whether it's positive or negative, uh, depending on the thickness of the material that you impose those ions on, you'll you'll get a force. You'll get an electrostatic adhesion force. You know, you can actually. I mean, I, I haven't done it, but I've read papers where you can take like a, a fairly thin book and charge it up with like you know fifty thousand volts. 
and have it like statically cling to the wall for like you know a couple of hours. The thing is obviously depending on the material. Some yeah. materials tend to have a positive charge, some tend to have a negative charge. That's right. So you gotta use that to the opposite. So, so you say right, but the, these 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 bars uh, uh, produce both pairs of ions, right, and, it, you and you can adjust it exactly, which is which is exactly what I was trying to get. Like, <laughs> you know, the 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 advancements and and the advantages of using switch mode power supplies have have been able to be uh, basically expounded and implemented in all these products where um, you know, the group as a general has come up with uh, some really clever ideas and patents that we've been able to leverage across uh, many products, not just bars, but we also make ionized, ionizing fans for like you know, uh, assembly, desktop assembly and stuff. So some of these patents uh, that the group has come up with have been, for example, one of the biggest questions the customer has is, you know, how do we calibrate this? And how do we know when you have to clean the pins because at the same time that you're ionizing to neutralize, you're also maybe picking up dust particles, which, you know, get bombarded on the pin, slightly change the pin geometry, and now you don't have a very sharp pin uh, that's really prepped up to, to get the ions in the target that you want them to be. So we have, you know, several patents that we've, made, we've been able to leverage, um, a self-calibrating meter movement patent, a multi-axis control patent where we can change the balance, uh, you know, change the voltage levels dynamically and adaptively, depending on, you know, the particular web speed and the and the charge. Uh, we also have an interleaving patent where we can actually use the web material itself, shut off the ionizer, and use it to measure uh, some quantitative value that's coming off of the web, and then make dynamic changes that are interleaved in the switching process. So a lot of this stuff, um, the quick takeaway from these slides is that having uh, the capability of, of uh, you know, creating switch mode power supplies, whatever your application is, really gives you, uh, uh, I would say, a great, a great amount of uh, control and dynamic range and uh, creativity to make different algorithms, uh, which is probably what's being expanded now uh, with electric vehicles and, and charging stations and all that. There's a bunch of new... I wouldn't say new new switching topologies, but they're looking at other methods and magnetics and devices are coming along for the ride for that. So that's really the takeaway here. Yeah, they do generate ozone. So, but it's a small small amount, and you know, it's a it's good ozone. <laughs> no, it's just, <laughs> Just by standing next to yeah. Them, so you 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 probably had the, right, negative ions. You want positive ions. Small ozone is good if the levels are low enough. Yeah. Well, ozone's an interesting science itself because um, you know it can be used as a as a odor neutralizer as well. So yeah, there's. Yeah. 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 Don't, don't have the natural amounts from outside. And yeah. it is actually good. But here's the thing. If it's enough that you can smell it without holding your nose directly at it, it's probably too high. Yeah. Just well, there, there, there are, I mean, depending on the level of, I should say ozone is good for you, but um, a to a slight degree it is. But the levels that we're generating with this, um, there's actual, um, how you say, uh, classification levels for ozone generation. Because, you know, if you leave a, an ionizer on in a room uh, and you have something like aluminum close to it or, or you know, aluminum particles, <laughs> well, you'll, you'll get some of that sort of uh, attraction on the pins and dirt debris pickup and stuff like that. And you'll cause rust eventually, yeah, you, you know, corrode, the corrode it's stuff. It's so. basically a leach. Well, that's, that's why they're yeah. So there, there's certain levels of threshold that we work within that, um, do not create a problem for the process that's being conveyed for the customers, you know? Um, so with that, I hope that gives you an idea, uh, at least based on what I've been working with, with the design group at the company, uh, with the team as a whole, how, how switching switch mode power supplies can come together. That was just an electrostatic application, uh, but there's a lot of uh, different areas where switch mode power supplies are really uh, making impact, a heavy impact. and 
now with the talk of, uh, you know, with the energy crunch happening and the, uh, how you say, the oil mining uh, getting hacked, uh, which cripples the economy sometimes and causes the gas prices to skyrocket. Um, and also the carbon footprint, uh, you know, now it's not, oil is not becoming very, very viable. So with that, let's just dive into, you know, switch mode power supplies. Um, in, in tune with in tune with like electric vehicles, you know, uh, from a historical point of view, electric vehicles is not something that's new. It's actually been around for a long time. And one of the things that I want you to keep in track here is like the years and the dates, because um, the advancements in electricity, magnetism, and uh, those special discoveries that led up to what we call now, you know, modern magnetics, almost run parallel to like uh, 1776, independence uh, of the United States. Um, but anyways, the, the first, the first uh, primary battery powered, all battery powered car using primary batteries was, was built by Robert Anderson. And that happened in 1832. They didn't. They used primary batteries. It was a one-time thing. So they secondary batteries for which you could charge. So they yeah. basically made the petrochemicals in there. And, and then it was done. done, yeah. But it was a concept thing, and he has a pa I tried looking for his patent. I couldn't find it, but he does have a patent on that. He was the first one that did that for a vehicle. Now, a couple of years later, uh, about 30 years later, Nikola Tesla uh, was the first one to you know, design and, and patent a radio-controlled electric boat which later was leveraged during wars, uh, it, it was basically weaponized for, for, for uh, in, in the Second World War, actually, for uh, digging, uh, digging for and searching for uh, mines. Uh, but those are the two ideas that really pivoted uh, and started the whole thing. And then obviously now there's talks about making uh, all electric powered airplanes. So, um, but anyways, uh, all this is being culminated due to the low carbon energy solutions. Oil is not very viable anymore. It's very tough to get that. It's uh, to many degrees, it's been politicized by certain governments and, and it, it could really collapse, you know, societies in, in many ways. So, you know, the interesting thing about all this is that, you know, there really isn't, or there really wasn't any roadmap to replace fossil fuels with alternative energies. So what's going on right now is you have two methods of doing this, either look for alternative energies that are chemical via biodiesel, um, ethanols, flex fuels, hydro, uh, hydrogen, fuel cells. And then you have the guys that are, that are looking at this thing purely from, hey, let, let, let's move away from oil altogether and let's, let's just move away from fuels altogether and just stick with electric. And under that uh, auspice, you have purely battery powered electric vehicles that use secondary batteries, those can be recharged. And then you had hybrid electric vehicles, which use both batteries and some alternative chemical fuel that's not oil. And, um, and then at one point they were thinking about power line rail type of vehicles, uh, like, like, you know, but those kind of fail out of, out of uh, popular, yeah, the infrastructure is nuts. And, and I, I think solar radiation is, is viable, but uh, there's just not enough energy density in solar cells um, to do that. You can, you know, and the way people travel these days, I don't think it's very uh, liable to do that. And then there's stored energy via flywheel magnetics that you have a storage box and then, you know, but essentially it's like a battery powered vehicle, except it has a storage energy device uh, based on flywheel mechanics. Uh, to have always a power source in there. But regardless, the way that things are moving now, um, regardless whether it's a chemical or electric or vice versa, the fundamental thing is power electronic conversion is required and is needed because of the different bus voltages that are being across. So it's a really exciting time to be an electrical engineer, physicist, or pursue any of the STEMs uh, right now because... But honestly... One of the things we seem to most feel to look at the U.S. is solar heating using simple panels. It's way cheaper, and it can do quite, a, and it can actually work surprisingly well in some situations. Just use your fisky, you know, tubes plated in black and water going. Yeah, on. yeah. I had a co I had a coworker that had th thermal heaters. Yeah, I. 
right. I've seen those. They they. Maybe maybe. But I'm not from Puerto Rico. I'm Cuban. <laughs> I don't know much about Puerto Rico. They're having a, they're, they're, yeah, well, they're having a serious infrastructure issue with, with the storms. The electric grid is very fragile over there. But, but no, in Cuba, actually, they, they've, uh, they've, they've been very heavily involved in solar because they're so close to the equator, just like Ecuador. So there's, there's a, when I visited there back in 08, I got a chance to go to the Kujai, which is like basically Cuba's version of an MIT, and um, you know, I have a cousin there that's a mechanical engineer, and uh, they, they're doing like some really wild stuff uh, with the solar radiation, and uh, and they have a lot of remote areas where there's no grid whatsoever, and they have DC grids running, uh, more reliable than AC grids, you know. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, like in tune with, with what we're talking about this uh, and, uh, today with the electric vehicles, there's, there's quite a bunch of different voltages that are going around standardized at the moment with conventional chemical batteries, lead acid batteries. Um, you know, you have lead acid batteries that are 12 volt DC, 14 volt DC, and then 24 volts for commercial vehicles. Now with electric vehicles, you know, you can have uh, lithium ion uh, battery pouches that are paralleled and series up to get 300, 400 volts. You may ask, well, why, why do we need such high, high voltages? Well, what it is, is, you know, they're, they're running, um, uh, they're running like the vehicles completely all electric in the sense that um, you have like motors, servo uh, asynchronous and synchronous motors uh, that have built in DC motor magnetics in them so that you can use the heavy torque on DC. So it could function as a DC motor for heavy torque on startup, but once it starts running, it runs at higher speed. So they need a, a synchronous or asynchronous. So you're getting a lot of two technologies in these uh, type of uh, electric motor engines. And to switch from a purely DC machine to an asynchronous AC machine, you need switch mode power supplies to be able to invert the power and you know, create a, basically, you're, 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 yeah, inside the motor, they're making them like, yeah, it's like two motors in a motor, and uh, you know, you're basically running like a micro grid in your vehicle at this point. You know what I mean? So you know, back back to these voltages, like in the European Union standard as it stands right now, um, they're using 230 volts uh, single phase, and they can get charging capacities of three kilowatts and 400 volts three phase to get uh, 22 kilowatts. Uh, outside in the US, they're using still 120, 110, single phase to do 3.3 kilowatt charging. And then you have these things called fast DC, DC chargers that, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they have uh, inverters that, that run up to 500 volts AC, but can provide 125 amps DC. And those are the fast chargers. So now if you own an electric vehicle, not all, all, the, all of those vertical chargers charge at the same rate and pace. So now, not only are you tasked to know how long your, your the longevity of your vehicle is gonna last for your trip, but now you also have to you know, shop around. And I think there's apps for that when you buy a vehicle that tell you which charging stations are short-term, long-term, and then you make adaptive changes to your trip. Oh, am I gonna stay overnight here? Then I can just afford to pay less kilowatt hour to charge this thing for eight hours to get a full charge versus, oh, I'm just going to grab something to eat for an hour and I really got to get on my 500 mile trip, you know? So there's a lot of things that are being tested onto the, the customer. So there's various different, you know, charging stations, AC level ones, uh, and then level twos, and then DC fast chargers that we just mentioned. And those are predicated primarily on, you know, the charge time for the vehicle and the, the battery capacity. So, you know, now, now when you purchase one of these vehicles, you have to be pretty keen on, on what you plan on doing with the vehicle uh, for long trips and such. Uh, <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, everything now in the electric vehicle is electrified. So no longer do you have, you know, mechanical mechanisms to do your steering. Now you have like servo motors 
that are doing that. And then we just went over the, the physical motors that are coupled right onto the axle of each tire. This is a two-wheel drive car, but you can have a four-wheel drive monster that has four, four motors, one on each uh, tire. So, you know, you need power conversion across the dynamics of the entire basically microgrid for your vehicle at this point. Um, and that's basically, you know, driven by, uh, you know, getting away from fossil fuels, oil, and, and the standard uh, components that we're familiar with on gasoline engine cars. Yeah. So, you know, from a historical point of view, I think you guys might know this, but folks that are not familiar with it, um, you know, magnetics plays a big role in this. And, uh, you know, from a historical point of view, uh, you know, J Joseph Henry, you know, he discovered self-induction and uh, in his days, uh, you know, mining for, for iron ore was a big deal. So he got heavily involved um, scientifically uh, in designing and discovering electromagnets and, and the self-induction. And actually, that's one of the, the biggest magnets, electromagnets that was wound for mining uh, iron ore. And that's uh, basically the market that drove that back in the day. But the important takeaway here is that he discovered electromagnetic self-induction phenomena. And the key that he, he um, the key takeaway is that the more turns that he compounded on a, on a ferrite or, or lamination material, the stronger and the more intensified the magnetic field was. But when you electrified the magnetic field and unplugged it, you would get a back EMF. You know, it was a phenomena he discovered. <laughs> and, and then Mike, and then Michael, and then Michael, if you look at the years, I mean, they're kind of like within a couple of years apart from each other. And then a couple of years later, Michael Faraday said, well, okay, that's great that you have one coil that you can do this with, but let's try to get magnetics to do some motion, some mechanical movement. So Michael Faraday was the one that, that invented the first, you know, kinetic motor, electrostatic motor per se. And, you know, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is uh, obviously Joseph Henry was was uh, given the honor of, 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 of having a unit named after him, the Henry for the coil with his magnetics. And the same thing for a uh, similar thing for Faraday, the capacitor, because, uh, you know, he, he discovered the electrostatic fields. Uh, energy can be stored in two plates, just uh, in the electrostatic field of two plates, akin to what uh, you know, uh, Joseph Henry uh, found that the the magnetic energy can be stored also magnetically in the coil, depending on the number of turns of the coil. Anybody, um, anybody who who, uh, hook, who tries to hook up a solenoid or, or, or relay coil to using a tra using a semiconductor realizes yeah. real fast about reverse EMF, either by blowing it or by getting their fingers across. Oh it, yeah, it yeah, that's a classic. Really yeah, so. Um, Again, uh, you know, we talked a lot. We a lot of covered a lot of this stuff uh, actually uh, interactively with with your responses. But you know, po power electronics, in a sense, is power processing, po power converting, changing power from you know DC or AC or vice versa, and changing the frequency. So, from a quick evolutionary point of view, you have uh, you know. Additional rotating machines were DC machines. So if you wanted to get DC to DC conversion, you just couple two of these rotating machines together. And the same thing, if you wanted to get AC power, you'd couple a DC machine with an AC machine and you get inversion. And then that later on came, uh, you know, rectification with the gas discharge tube, uh, which is a mercury arc type of rectifier. And then in the 19, you know, 30s or something, or the, uh, the turn of the century, actually, vacuum tubes were invented initially the diode uh, by John Fleming and then, you know, the triode. And that kind of was what accelerated power electronics, although not recognized as a field, but that's what kind of put it on the map. And then it really exploded in 47 uh, down the street from here in Jersey where, where uh, Bell Labs was uh, with the invention of the, or the discovery of the transistor. Selenium. Th those were the early semiconductor diodes. Where they were, they were a diode. They were a diode, yeah. Was copper yeah. Was copper and so were Galena diodes, but you don't find those. Although I, I <laughs> we found we found an old power supply. Actually, the director of the group did, and and uh, it was an interesting power supply, like 1945s, and it had these like big, big giant diodes. It didn't look like the diodes I recognized, but we were kind of yeah, chuckling, like, yeah, there were selenium diodes. <laughs> 
But the thing works actually, and it's uh, a. Yeah. Uh, they still use a little bit of these like elevator bolts and places. Interestingly enough, they charge you for that. Yeah, Interestingly enough, there was also a thing called the synchronous mechanical rectifier used in the early days of how a hobby radio worked. Car radio used to have a big kind of problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, no. I'm talking about a commutator and brushes and a synchronous motor. Yeah, oh, yeah. That no, no. No coils other than the motor. You're spinning. You take a motor. Yeah, but you'd have to have separate slip rings. Yes. To get DC or AC. No, I'm not it's simpler. I'm talking. You have a motor. And it's spinning a, another commutator with brushes. And if you spin it at the right speed, it switches the AC at the right they, at the right rate. Yeah, to get yeah, the yeah that mechanical rectifier. They, yeah. they, oh, yeah. that's in one of these guys here. Yeah. Motor matches the line frequency. Yes, right. They're a little bit crude, crude, and they can be a little noisy, but they worked. Yes. So, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, also. Get his vibrators and extra contacts that do the same thing. Yeah, and I'm going to get into that actually with Charles F. Ketterin, who who was the prime contributor to inventing the the motor starter. Because back then, when when the automotive industry took off, and and coincidentally, the automotive industry took off in the 1900s because it was first of all Ford came in and he systematically created the assembly line, which made it real cheap. Oil and the environment was not a concern back then, so that kind of like muted. The battery powered stuff and accelerated the modern uh, uh, gas engine vehicle. And with the process of that, you know, Charles Kettering back, back then you had to crank your own car. So he created the, the self starting motor, which la later led to a patent on the first mechanical flyback converter uh, based on points on the distributor cap where you would align. It's kind of like what you were talking about the multi vibrator. Uh, type of thing where uh, you 14, that's the vibrator. yeah well that would be yeah. A little yeah but the other thing is literally mechanically using an armature I mean a computer yeah 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 so you were mechanically switching polarity at the right rate at so the right know, rate yeah yeah that was another thing again that was early radio types played with this mostly but it may have been used for other things too yeah yeah they left, they left out the balance yes they did oh yeah the He's correct. <laughs> no you're right but anyway, this is his crude patent and how it functions. And the only reason why this was created was to be able to generate a high enough voltage to break the spark gap in the spark plug so that you can correctly, you know, ignite the chamber inside the cylinder at top dead center and cause the mechanical stroke down to continue your power stroke. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, facts here. You know, the first consumer products that used switch mode power supplies was the Apple II. And that was the the switch mode power supply that we used on that was uh, a chuk converter. Was wow. the first chuk. It uses two active coils. It, uh, I'll I'll get into that later. And uh, the self oscillating uh, circuit was also used on the HP uh, thirty five. And uh, okay, so you know. I, I really enjoy the field that I work in, power conversion, because it's multidisciplinary. Um, you're not going to be working on like a single thing, so you're never going to have like a dull moment in this field. It's very exciting because you'll you'll borrow themes from uh, systems and controls. You have to know something about control back theory. You have to know about switch control, signal synthesis, and communications to generate the PWM signals that you need to switch this. You also have to know something about semiconductor devices. Um, you know, and how to design uh, semiconductor analog and digital circuits so that they can work with, uh, you know, the control system. And you also have to know some thermodynamics to some degree because you want these things to switch very, very fast. But an adverse effects of doing that is, you know, generating heat and how to get rid of it efficiently. And the ultimate goal is to, you know, transfer power, create power, condition the power to the various uh, devices that you're trying to energize. So with that, there's, you know, we talked about these themes already, and uh, I'm gonna kind of go through these really fast because we talked about these and I wanna get through all the slides. Um, you know, power conversion uh, has different classifications. When you take a single DC source and you dither it back and forth, you create an alternating uh, source 
and that's called an, a power inversion. If you take an AC source of a certain frequency and convert it to another AC source of a different frequency, it's called cyclo conversion. If you take an AC source uh, and convert it to a DC source, it's called rectification. And then the rest of the converters uh, are typically DC to DC type, and we we either call them DC to DC converters or just plain Jane converters, you know. But that's pretty much the classification of converters that you'll ever stumble into. And it's a it's a, a an example of how this works is you'll have like the sol the sun energizing these solar cells. You need to have a DC to DC converter to uh, you know charge your batteries then you know you want to take the the batteries that you've stored this charge in and now you need to convert it to ac to run your your house or to sell power back to the grid so you need an inverter to do that and let's say you want to you know power you know our phones which is a device everyone pretty much has but from your house now you need a, a an ac to dc converter to to charge your phone from the wall outlet in your house and then if you're on the go like most of us are You'll you'll want to have a USB port in your vehicle, or you'll get one of these uh, USB uh, cigarette lighter dongles that has a USB port to be able to do DC to DC conversion to change 12 volts DC to 5 volts, 2 amps, or whatever. So you can see how how we've all interacted with switch mode power supplies and and probably never really realized it, or at least to what degree. And then the devices that that are are able to do this for us are inductors because they can store the energy in the magnetic charge switches, but they're not used as amplifiers. They're used as pure switches. And the reason why we do that is because when, you know, a switch is completely closed, the uh, the voltage drop across the switch is zero, even though it could be sourcing or sinking a huge amount of current. So the power product is ideally zero, but the switches are not ideal. And the same thing with um, with the diodes, you know, they, they have a forward drop, but you know, they're they're like more of a passive switch and the transistors are active switches. Resistors, we tend to stay away from power conversion because they're very inefficient, but we do need analog electronics to sense the voltage and to scale back and to, you know, create the control circuit that drives it. Why do you uh, call FETs passive? I don't know what that's what you mean. Which one? You call the FET a passive switch? No, the, the diode is what you called a, uh, uh, an active switch. The transistor is an active switch and, and the diode is passive. Passive in the sense that you have to feed a passive voltage to turn it on. Active. It can't change state. It can't change state, exactly. It only does it passively. So, you know, with the inductor and the capacitor, uh, you know, ideally they're not supposed to dissipate any power, but we know that there's non idealities in both of those devices. So, uh, you know, the interesting takeaway from all this is that you have to have volt second balance and you have to have charge second balance. Okay. So you can't, you know, you can't operate these devices when you turn them on or off, both the capacitor or the inductor, without having charge balance in the capacitor or voltage uh, second balance in the inductor, because otherwise you would get asymmetric switching and you would get uh, an, uh, an accumulated amount of charge in the case of the capacitor or a huge accumulated charge in the inductor where in its off state, it doesn't auto reset. So you can have the damaging of the device. So, you know, auto reset. That's different from resonate? That's different from resonate, yeah. The interesting thing is we get, we take it for granted, but the AC conversion that happens off the grid typically has automatic reset built into it because you're feeding it with a sine source. So there's always a zero crossing in the sine wave. When you do DC to DC, power supply in their peerless form, that there is no zero crossing. You have to be aware of that and you have to account for that. Otherwise you get asymmetric switching and you can get a runaway condition and you know Ampere's law gets violated and you'll have smoke. <laughs> so with that, uh, we you know we we vary the duty cycle ratio and then we uh, you know we we uh, peak detect and filter out the high frequency harmonics in the PWM signal and you get ideally pure DC, but there's always some ripple and that's usually governed by voltage or current ripple. That's usually governed by the load that you're trying to, you know, uh, energize. You know, there's different criteria for different loads. And then back to switches. So these are the three primary devices you're going to be using, inductors, capacitors and switches. And ideally, 
they're supposed to dissipate zero power, but we know that that's not the case. So a quick example, not a switch mode power supply in itself, but it kind of exhumes the process of automatic reset is this simple uh, AC to DC converter. It's a 60 hertz transformer that has a full bridge rectifier. You can see that the input has automatic reset with the sine wave. So there's no need to keep uh, keep in mind volt second or charge second balance. But the one thing that you want to do is have flat DC. So you'll have ripple voltage or current. And then you decide on how much ripple you can sustain on the load and you gauge your capacitor based. Obviously, these power supplies are much bigger because you're operating at 60 hertz. So the capacitors are going to be pretty girthy. The beauty about uh, you know taking some of these techniques and using switch mode techniques is now the frequency could be whatever you want. 60 hertz uh, becomes 60 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz. They have one megahertz switches. Exactly. So in, in keeping in theme with these three devices, you have uh, a switching, an active switching device, a transistor, a passive switching device, a diode, and an inductor. And depending on how you orient these three devices, you get what we call a topology. The first topology is a buck topology. This, uh, which takes a, a high voltage and bucks it down to a lower voltage, so it's a down converter. The next orientation by switching the inductor, the position and location of the inductor, transistor, and diode is a boost topology, and that takes a, uh, a, a particular input voltage and raises it up even higher. Um, and then you can have a, you can have both. You can have a, a buck boost topology where you can either boost or buck raise or lower the voltage. And then if you take uh, a basic buck boost and then you apply Faraday's transformer to that center coil in the third example and you have one-to-one -one ratio, now you can disconnect that center node and create a flyback converter. So that, that's kind of like the sequential process on how to go from a buck boost topology, replace the single inductor with a two winding inductor they're both connected to the same node. And now since you have isolation, you can just cut those two nodes and now you get a transformer. But now if you look at the dot polarity of, of the flyback, it's chosen in such a way that you store the energy when the switch is turned on and then you release the energy when it's shut off. Ideally, it works, but it's not, it's not the best converter. The best converters are something that has automatic reset. That would be like the mecca of switch mode power supplies, which would be something like what we're getting off the grid. But since we're essentially creating that manifestation by orienting these components in that topology, depending on the function that you want to reach. So again, uh, you know, power supply design is very multidisciplinary. You have to know something about magnetics, BH loop, uh, magnetic dynamics. Um, and what you, the th big takeaway from all this is where do you operate on this BH loop? Most single switch devices operate on, on quadrant one, which is the top right, which means you're only using half, half of the magnetic loop. Now you might wanna do that for power supplies that are like 500 watts or less or 100 watts or less. But if you're doing very narrow uh, input voltage supply to much higher current, you'll wanna utilize the entire BH loop which means you, you need to have at least two switching devices to switch uh, across the axes between quadrant one, top right, and quadrant three, bottom left, so to get two switches. two switches, yes. And that, that uh, I'm gonna get into that in a second. Uh, and then you would use obviously Faraday's law uh, to figure out you know, what, what density and volume and power and current you want. Since the transformer is a voltage device, it, it doesn't uh, saturate on current. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, I have a few examples on there so you can get a, a, an idea of what lamination transformers look like, what the switching devices look like, and also what the inductive devices look like. And eventually you can use those or some version or flavor of those depending on, on, the, on the size, density, and power that you want to generate. Like in that case, you have a wall wart that has all those elements just built into a much smaller, and you can get a feel from the far right, the lamination size and the weight versus uh, you know, the size of the little adapter on the far left. So there's, there's different uh, magnetic geometries, different magnetic materials that you need to look at. You have to look at, this is just a idealized BH loop, but if you look at the very top right quadrant, uh, that's what you get in a data sheet depending on the particular ferrite that you're using. Not only that, but the efficiency and the uh, 
<clears throat> the amount of uh, uh, power that you can get out of the transformer is predicated a lot uh, by minimizing these losses. And one of the things that you have to experiment with, it's kind of like a black art, is the layer, the wire layer, the wire lay as you're winding the transformer, whether you have universal lay, straight lay, interleave lay, uh, that plays a big role. So it's kind of, you have to kind of experiment with that to get, you know, the best bang for your buck when you're designing. Magic there, so yeah, and then there's devices out there that help you, like frequency response analyzers that you can sweep and you can see, oh yeah, you know, the natural resonance of this inductor and what the leakage is at this frequency, comparatively speaking, relative to your switching frequency, saturation. you can see how far are your saturation for material. Yeah. So anyways, these are these are kind of like the advanced uh, topologies. The 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 fundamental ones are the buck boost, buck boost, and uh, forward flyback and push pull. And then beyond that, you have bridge topologies that uh, utilize the full quadrant. Any 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 of these switchers that have a single transistor will only operate on the top right quadrant. Two transistors or four gives you the full quadrant. And you may wonder, well, why do I need four transistors on the input? Well, because sometimes you may want to, you have to have it because you have to have volt second balance. And unless you have, if you look at these transformers over here, like for example, in the case of the push volt, pull, you get automatic volt second reset because it's a center tap winding. But for example, something for half bridge or full bridge, you got single primary, so you have one coil, so you have to be able to discharge that energy stored in that coil to have volt second balance and have automatic reset. That's why you need the four transistors. Essentially, you're driving it with an H bridge. Yeah. Okay, so now for charging stations, and the new, the new advance to this is to have the same um, four quadrant bridge on the secondary so that now you can have bi-directional switching. In other words, you can you can adaptively make the power supply buck, boost, and invert in one direction as a DC to DC, or you can make it invert in the other side, or you can make it cycle convert. So you would basically have uh, the full bridge on the primary and a full bridge on the secondary. But some of those power supplies are really for high density. That's why that, that topology, uh, bidirectional uh, topology is used primarily for the charging stations because they're like, you know, 500 kilowatt to generate, you know, 150 amps or something like that. So while you're designing these supplies in any industry, um, as a designer, you have to keep in mind as to where you're gonna sell this device, where does it fall in the market? What is the classification of the device that you're designing it for, which particular market it's gonna be used, whether it's home, commercial, and all of that is, is, uh, is gonna predicate on how you uh, you know, lay out your device and perform tests and do performance matrix that are required based on the regulatory compliance for safety operation of the devices. And, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is done through electromagnetic compatibility, which is another battery of tests that your device has to be able to sustain. It can't inject harmonics, however, it has to be able to, uh, you know, receive harmonics. Um, they do both. Yeah, so you'll you'll take your power supply to like an anechoic chamber, which is basically an EMF dead, Faraday cage dead room, and then they'll do like conductive and radiated tests, and then they'll also use what they call a listen, a line impedance stabilization network. Uh, if it runs off of the AC line, they can see how much harmonics uh, your device is injecting or not, based on the on the threshold limits of the classification that you're trying to apply for. And if you are violating those classifications, then you have to create active filters or whatever you need to do to quarantine the issue. Unfortunately, in the world, that doesn't happen. What's going on is, especially in China, they'll submit something that has a certain amount of filtering to, to pass the test, and then the commercial ones have all those components off the board. Yeah. The damn thing is broad, it's a broadband noise generator. Yeah, yeah, yes and no. Oh, quite a bit of it is. I can show you dozens of power supplies. Just, not so much the big names, but everything else. It's amazing how all the yeah, well, there's a constant battle. That's what I'm saying. You should certify product safety. I, I'm not, you get legitimate ones that have been done. I've not, I've not seen that personally on like wall wards, but I have seen it on like LED light bulbs and stuff like that. Any radio amateur short listener, what they think of switch mode power supplies on computers, on, on 
LED light. I don't see LED, some LED light bulbs, definitely CFL light bulbs, and other things that have switch modes of place. You will get an earful from every one of them. I think yeah. that is the problem. Is, the problem is the problem is there's there's a surveillance. Every product safety scheme there has a surveillance aspect to it. And they're supposed to do six month surveillances yeah. and, and verify, yeah. you know, components and yeah. all that stuff. It's Most a, of them do not meet part fifteen and it's just Dirties the airways, horrible. I believe it. I believe yeah. it. In fact, the old joke is CE, which is which is one of these certifications. The old yeah. joke that means Chinese export. It's always the old joke. Chinese export. I never heard that. Understood. It's a problem. All right. So we're almost coming towards the tail end here. So I don't want to keep anyone up because I'm very interested in hearing the special note speaker. So I'm going to rush through these slides. Um, Anyways, the first integrated circuit that was created for switch mode power supplies was uh, made by uh, Robert Mamano. Uh, it was the SG 1524 and it encompassed everything that you need, uh, including the feedback servo, the uh, digital drivers for the external devices. So all you had to do is come up with the magnetics and the external transistors, the power transistors that you were gonna drive. And pretty much it's a uh, self-sustained PWM converter with the full steering flip flop oscillator, you know, air amp and everything. Pretty much that was the roadmap uh, up until today. Like you got specialized ICs, but generally speaking, they have all those systematic functions built in. The thing that that they're trying to do now or that they're exploring now is implementing the real high power devices with the advances of silicon carbide and gallium nitride. They're trying to go a full like basically take this chip and put the power device in there. The one thing, uh, and obviously the mecca would be to do the same thing with magnetics, but there's no no Moore's law for magnetics. And it's getting to the point where like you open up a power supply and, and I wouldn't say it's an eyesore, but the most obvious thing is the magnetics. You can't, you just can't get rid of it. You know, they would love to make it small enough uh, to fit in an IC. And there's been a lot of experimentation done. And I'm sure there's some PhD guys working on this sort of thing where you know, they're trying to like make integrated magnetics in the ICs, but it's still very exploratory. A lot of it is mostly academic research at this point, but that's kind of like the next evolution in, in power supply design. Um, again, this is just a, a, another device. I, I call it cousin device, TL494, uh, also from a Unitrode um, that has all the internal functions in there kind of exploded for you in digital and analog logic. Very popular. Chip. Yeah, it's pretty much used on every single SMPS for a computer power supplies, everything. Yeah. So this is like a, a, a Xerox machine and uh, it sort of uh, gives you a glimpse of uh, now that you guys have been exposed to this stuff, you can kind of look at this circuit and say, oh, yeah, well, that's the transformer. That's a switching device. This area over here is the feedback servo and this is the PWM. So and then because it has one transistor and one transformer, you can see that that it mimics and looks like a flyback. And in fact, it really is in this case. Uh, you know, so you start developing uh, an eye for this sort of thing. So, you know, uh, moving on to a particular example, uh, as I mentioned before, I, I uh, you know, fix audio amplifiers and sort of build some as well. And uh, this has been an ex a, a evolutionary thing that I've been trying to do is get rid of both transformers in the in the audio amplifier for tubes, get rid of the power transformer and get rid of the audio transformer. But right now my focus is the power transformer and the crazy choke. Everything works on 60 Hertz. So, you know, just to get a feel for what, what, what I'm trying to do here is, you know, you got a mono block and if you want to make a stereo block at $530, the total weight, about 34 pounds. If you look at just the power transformer to generate the six volt filament, um, you got a transformer that's quite huge, weighs nine pounds, and, and it's geared towards a power density of 50 watts. And then you have the audio transformer, weighs a little less than the power transformer, five pounds, 50 watts, and the cost of the audio transfer, 80 bucks, and the power transformer, 90 bucks. Well, I threw so many of those things out. Good iron is expensive, let's put it that way. 
So, so what you guys see there is a, a Leslie Class A tweed amplifier um, from the 1930s. Uh, nothing crazy exotic. It's just a Class A amplifier. In fact, it, you could say it's like a rubber stamp type of topography with the addition of different uh, tone controls. But the concentration here is eliminate the power transformer that does the six volt for the filaments, right? Um, so again, the lamination transformer, 90 bucks, nine pounds, 50 watts. And I was able to do a, a buck converter operated at, at 50 kilohertz versus 60 hertz. Uh, it weighs seven tenths of a pound and it does 60 watts. And it only costs eight bucks. So you can see like the radical changes uh, with switch mode power supplies in this case for a six volt uh, filament transformer. Uh, potentially at 50 watts. Uh, I mean, this thing weighs seven tenths of a pound. And what you're seeing there is a prototype. Obviously, you wouldn't you wouldn't dare try to. Uh, it's basically, it's that circuit. Yeah, it's that circuit. Okay. Yeah. How do you eliminate the output transformer? Oh, I I didn't get to that part yet. Yeah. I'm still working on that. Because if you use a token poly or one of those configurations, you don't need a transformer. Well, the bucket on the bucket converter is for the power transformer. <coughs> Yeah, but it also the output. Not in this case. This one, just yeah. The audio the, one's still on that, and I think so. But they are. But the, what you're seeing there is just the buck converter for the six volt yeah. filament. That's it. Okay. I don't have that, but the rest of the circuit, the tubes and everything that you see there is is that. I, I I'm actually working on that now. I'm experimenting with a couple of different. You need that output. Yeah, you do because of the high impedance of the plate coming yes. off the tube. You know, it's something in the orders of five kilo ohms or something like that. Two tubes and then you can maybe drop it to both. Yeah, but the interesting, what got me turned on into looking at different methods to do that for the output transformer is the fact that the output trans, the audio output transformer is typically center tapped in the case of a push pull. So you, you're running DC, which is bad news for lamination, right? Yeah. Uh, you don't need to, you don't need to gap it in that sense because it's got automatic reset. OK, versus class A, you where you have to add a little gap, yeah, you know, because otherwise you'll get a, a voltage saturation. Right. So, you know, if you can ideally, um, like I said, I'm working experimentally with that. I, I'm looking at it like taking some some theories from 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 the push pull that's non gapped and using modulation techniques with ferrite. Do you, you know what I mean? Quality output transformers that are linear are damn expensive. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, now, if, if, a little less so, but they're still expensive. If you if you took a most output transformers have a low frequency response that get that clips off at like seventy hertz. If you were to build like a pure acoustic, you know, ten hertz to twenty kilohertz or twenty hertz to twenty kilohertz. The thing would be huge. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah so you know, you're absolutely right on that. So, anyways, this is this is the topology that you see built there. It's a buck converter. This is the calculations. It works at 45 kilohertz, and uh, you know, based on that, the duty cycle is at 0.26 using the TL494. I apologize for my pay wiring diagram that you see there. It's not the best way to do this, but <laughs> but but, it, but, the, but I guarantee you that the oscilloscope uh, signals that you're going to see from that are very clear. So don't be discouraged by the rat's nest of wires. This is uh, hand calculations. I, I went through a couple of iterations with this, running it at 20 kilohertz versus 45 kilohertz, pros and cons. Uh, of raising the frequency, lowering the voltage, changing the duty cycle, selecting the type of inductor, uh, gapped inductor or uh, orthogonal magnetic inductor. So that's just kind of like the hand calculations of that. So yeah, I, I ultimately went with, with, with the design on the right just to make the devices a lot smaller with the higher frequency of operation. Yeah, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, it's a it's a buck converter topology, and uh, you know a lot of this stuff is not is not a, a proprietary in sense. You know, you can look up a dozen data sheets. Anyways, this this thing that you see there side by it is actually the load test. I didn't have an electronic load, so I had to use a resistive load. But the takeaway here is you got a graph of the data. 
the voltage versus the amps for different taps of uh, load. And you can see the horizontal line hasn't really moved from six amps. And then these are the energetic waveforms. The top one is the inductor current. The bottom one is the, is the uh, switching voltage. The average uh, coming out of that is 6.69 volts. And, you know, it did some calculative calculations based on, you know, uh, percent error, what I calculated, what I measured, took the difference. So it worked out pretty well. And then on the right is, is the measurement that I took with it energized on the bench. And uh, this is just uh, uh, a oscilloscope that they have at my job, which is way nicer. So I was able to capture uh, all the s similar waveforms on there. The addition of the bottom green trace is the switching time ramp on the oscillator. You know, this doesn't have current mode control, but I, I plan on implementing current mode control for a much li a lot larger dynamic range and stability. And then what you see there uh, is just a prototype. It's a class A. I've never seen a two channel class A. So I decided to build it. And that's what I'm what you see there. It's a stereo class A. <laughs> and uh, like I said, it's uh, it's not in its final form because it's a work in progress. But some of the things that I want to add to this is some alarm circuit, obviously some little analog VU meters to uh, you know monitor the 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 sound I thought it was in charge. sound oh. level. <laughs> No. The LEDs, I thought the green LEDs would be good for power. You know, the yellow would be overload and, and the green would be it distortion. Nice. <laughs> kind of interesting, you know. Oh, the analog meter is cool. I don't know where you buy them. China. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then for those of you guys uh, that are interested, these are some of the books that I, I – consider them like my Bible, to be honest with you. I definitely keep them very close by and I review them all the time. I've read most of them I, I used in college, actually, when I was working on my master's, um, you know, and they're very interesting books. But I find that there's two style of books. There's theoretical books that are heavy on the calculus and the math. And it's great to have that in-depth knowledge from a start from scratch perspective. But it's also good to have practical books that have practical design examples. So these are some of my favorite theoretical books, and I have quite a lot more practical books. Um, you know, there's other elements that we haven't covered in, in this presentation, and that's frequency response, stability control, but I kind of just wanted to gear it uh, for the audience so that folks that know what it is can appreciate it, and folks that don't know what it is can at least, uh, you know, pique their interest and they can kind of pursue the knowledge, um, which is uh, also good. And then um, these are more practice books. Um, you know, the Power Supply Cookbook is a really good one if you are if you don't know anything about switchers, if it's one book that you should probably read that will give you a good a good feeling for everything is, is uh, you know, the Marty Brown book. I've actually spoke with him on the phone uh, quite a bit and he's looking at, redoing that book and we've been parlaying back and forth with some ideas um, but it's a really really good book for someone uh, who ha either has some medium level or is coming up incrementally in it and would like to learn more it's a really good book and then there's the colonel colonel william i think he's retired now he's from jet propulsion labs in nasa i've also spoke to him as well he's got a pretty interesting software suite that, that he still publishes on a cd and it's pretty decent. I mean, it's not all inclusive. Most of these magnetic design tools are not all inclusive. You have some tools that are great for um, heavy synthesis and analysis, and some of them are just for designing the physical magnetics aspect, and some of them are all just on control. You don't really find like one tool that has everything in it. It's very hard to do that. So this is a field that uh, I think an instrument of that caliber is very well needed. I think to take it to the next level. And with that, I, I think we kind of made good time, right? Excellent. And uh, I appreciate your participation and everything. And so, good luck. But did you yeah. really like to get it for us or for another presentation for IBM or something? Like no, this is just for you guys. This is not not a reuse or anything. You've been doing this for a few years. Well, I, the funny thing is, I've been doing power exclusive power supply no, design. Oh, I've been doing it for like. Five or six years. Yeah. So 
it's a theme that that's reoccurring. And the interesting thing last year's theme was uh, fossil fuel in the environment, and this year is electric vehicles. It's kind of a theme where it's inter interleaved into a lot of different areas. Uh, you, can't get rid of you, you can't get rid of it. It's like I, I was just telling him. I said it's funny. It's like it's like the last thought. Uh, of the design process sometimes, and it's almost like a missing thought, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Until they say, oh, okay, we got to power this thing. How are we going to power this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's becoming very pronounced now. And I think now with, with the advancements of, um, you know, electric vehicles and such, it's it's only really getting a lot more exposure. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of proliferation in switch mode power supplies, and I think now that now the the research area, as I see it, is not just faster devices that have uh, more power densities and more current and can handle more voltage, but I think I think the field needs more logical sense, and they need to look at how to leverage these topologies because although the buck, the boost and the buck boost and the coop topologies are fundamental to switch mode, they're not by any means efficient. And in fact, it's my belief that they should probably be retired. You know, that there's, um, yeah, you're only using single quadrant switching and you don't get the automatic reset. And I think now there's a big proliferation now with resonant topologies the LLC, the CCL, and uh, now they even make uh, bridgeless power factor correction, you know, using, uh, how you say, um, resonance switching. You use the resonance off of that and, and you don't need a bridge. And you can also, you know, time shift it and get three phase out of it yep. as well, you know? So there's, there's a lot of interesting areas that are being explored right now. Um, yeah, you have a question. I, I know when you use a 60 cycle transformer, yeah. 200 watts, and you know it's going to weigh five pounds. The one that's running in switching mode is weighing an eighth of a pound. Higher frequency. So, yeah. so how does the, I understand the frequency goes up, the bigger inductance goes up, and that's what I remember from airplanes 30 years ago. But why is the power density? So good on that little tree. Okay, the, 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 key, the key takeaway for that is, is Faraday's equation. If you look at, at Faraday's equation, E equals d phi dt, and you increase the, you got N, now you have a primary and a secondary, but you never wind a transformer with a single turn, right? So you have to have N1, N2, and the signal that you're feeding in the primary is the same, it's the same flux rotating inside the magnetic component, right? So now you got to look at the next equation. Well, how, how much flux do I need? The B max, okay? This is a BH loop. So you have to design within the confines of this BH loop, right? So the, the, the thing, the magic that you see there on that presentation of different style of magnetics and different sizes, you need to decide how much, you know, when you design a power supply, the first thing you look at is what's my input voltage? What's my output voltage? What is my load current that I desire? From that, you work in reverse and say, okay, if I need this, it, it translates to power transfer, right? Eventually. Uh, so you look at how much voltage I need at the output, how much current I need at the output, and then that's gonna tell you, well, how much voltage you're gonna feed it from, right? And then that's gonna translate to, well, how much ripple current can I tolerate on, on my load? You know, if it's a sensitive load like a computer, maybe you need you know, something like, you know, 50 microamps or something like that of Ripple. So the short answer, <laughs> yeah. the reason why you're still getting 200 watts and this little tiny transformer is because it's not saturated? It's it, saturated? No, it's the material. You're going from lamination material, yeah. which yeah. is 60 hertz. That's that, on yeah. that piece of wood. So you're going to that to soft ferrite. That's one of the key reasons. That's one of the key it's reasons, it's but it's also the volume frequency. and the oh, frequency. What does he do? I know you said it, but if you use that, because the ferrite at 60 cycles, it wouldn't work very well, but it works fine at the higher frequencies. Why? Because of the because of the diamagnetic composition of the ferrite. So efficiency increases. Yes, because you're using using ferromagnetic material, which operates at a much higher frequency. So that translates to if you look at Faraday's equation. 
frequency is in the denominator there, right? So the higher you make that frequency, the, the smaller the, the flux density required for the voltage that you, that you need, E, on top. And then, and then H translates to, on the horizontal axis, you have H, coercive force. H equals, you know, the units of H is ampere turn per meter, right? So N is ampere turn, right? Per meter means the magnetic path that you're traversing to generate that flux. So you have to start off with how much flux do I need? How much flux linkage do I need? Flux link linkage lambda equals B over H, right? B over A, sorry. And that translates to area. So from the geometry of the flux that's required based on the operating frequency, you can come up with an area. And then from that area, you can come up with the core volume for the power that you need. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's do a simple, I mean, let's ignore ferrite for a If you went from 60 seconds to 120 seconds on a transformer and, and the magnetics was correct, you could make it smaller just because you went to 120 seconds. But you have to change the material. Yeah, you change the material. And you, oh. would, get, you would get more. You would get more power density. Yeah, but yeah. Look, at this, look at it in reverse. If you take, let's say you take a transformer that right to run at 60 cycles and you run it at 50. It's going to run a little warmer. Warm. Run that one at 25 cycles and it's going to fry an egg. Right. You need a much bigger core for the lower frequency. The lower right. Frequency the same yeah, material. But, but that's because the inductance got low and it lets more current in and, and you didn't want it there. Again, it's saturated. It is saturation. Did you need that extra well, that's fryer. a question. Saturation versus. Now, obviously, when you go high enough, you can't use normal steel. You would need something like ferrite or something else that yeah. can handle higher frequencies. But the efficiency then goes up. So what happens if you use ferrite in 60 cycles? What happens then? The, 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 the metallurgy of the material doesn't is it's frequency not limited. Not. If, if, it, it, it would work, but it would distort like crazy. Like you, There's nothing stopping you from well, taking a ferrite and winding... Hundred turns, making one to one ratio, it, it'll get cut off because it's frequent. It's saturated, because it's saturated. No, because it's frequency limited. It, it's a, it's a metallurgical thing with the ferrite. It doesn't. The the magnetic domains don't activate at the same frequency for ferrite versus lamination. Can you repeat that? I, I missed the front part of that. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. had a big toroidal transformer in the middle, and it ran on 60 cycles. They were not the switch mode, and they were just fine. Yeah, they're lamination. No, no, they're ferrite. Yeah, ferrite. And they no, made, they, 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 they really? Made, it yeah. might be a different. It might be a different. Well, it might it might be amorphous. A yeah, yeah. There, there's amorphous. There are some ferrites that work. At low frequency, most of them are used for for chokes and filters. So you can expunge that and use it for that. Amorphous works much. Uh, okay, I, I believe it. There, there's some ferrite, but it's typically not used for power. Typically used for like noise suppression and chokes. Maybe not, but I remember that plenty of power supply transformers that years ago back in the back in the same eighties or the nineties. No, my list. Yeah. What? Well, the table. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. Yes. Yeah. All right, uh, you, you know, sir. I didn't look to see if there was any questions on here. Well, well, we put, you oh, think on. you auto reset because you don't want too much energy in the capacitor and too much energy in the inductor as being in balance. I think you used another word that I never heard. Is there another word comes to people? What was that? Automatic reset for the magnetics? Uh, yeah, for magnetics. You mentioned that you don't want too much energy in the cap. You, the yeah, you okay. For the capacitor, you need to have charge, charge balance. That was the other word. Okay, okay the and then for the, for the magnetics, you need to have volt second. Balance. Like you want to say something there. Dave. Oh. Charge balance. This is Jake. Participants, Dave, guess. You know, I'm not familiar with this tool. No, I hate that. There's too many. So where are we? Well, uh, well, thank you, everyone, for 
staying around and okay. enjoying. Yeah, appreciate it. Good to meet you. I'll probably see you with the guest speaker. Yeah, cool. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So I think I'm just going to.